Sideshow presents Get Super with Joshy G. Featuring today's special guest, Bren Foster. It's time to get super, super. Hey guys, what's going on? I'm Joshy G, and welcome to another episode of Get Super with Joshy G, an international edition. It's actually probably the first time ever that we've been able to do this. Uh, I have the one and only Bren Foster joining us all the way from Australia. Bren, how are you doing, my friend? How are things going on down there? Yeah, pretty good, Joshy. Um, life in Australia is uh, pretty normal uh, amid all the, uh, the COVID craziness, so uh, I can't complain. It's pretty good here. I, I hear life is somewhat back to normal down there. I'm very jealous, very envious, but there is light at the end of the tunnel up here, so hopefully we'll be able to uh, see each other sooner rather than later. At least I'd like to think so. Sounds good. Um, so, for those that you don't know, for those of you that don't know, Bren is uh, an actor, uh, works or dabbled in some stunts. Uh, is there anything else that I'm missing, Bren, besides those two wonderful things? Uh, no, not really. Pretty much uh, actor, martial arts. Never really was a, a, a stunt man. Um, I do my own stunts um, as an actor, uh, especially the uh, the martial arts stuff, um, because um, I don't want anyone else doing my martial arts. <laughs> Is that a a you you don't want anybody to? You don't think that there is a stunt man that would possibly be able to emulate the moves that you can do because you're so well versed, or do you like? the the challenge of being able to do your own stunts uh i think it's it's a it's a bit of both um i i do come from a very heavy martial arts background and i i am quite well known in in, in that world so if something's and, and films forever uh, a good friend of mine ron ron balicki always said that to me he goes mm-hmm. he said films forever and it kind of stuck with me um and if if i'm doing any martial arts on, on screen that's representing myself or my character I want to do it because that way I can ensure how good it's performed, how well it's performed, and um, it's it's important that um, that I do it. And I, if if I'm doing something for my character, it's very very important I have a true representation of the skill that that character has. So yeah, there's a bit of both. I, I feel like the level I want it to come across as, and the level I want to perform it as, um, if I'm doing doing it, I, I know I've got control of it. Yeah, and that, I, I love that. I think that's great. You hear so many stories. Certain actors want to be able to do their own stunt for so many different reasons, and I love that you actually have uh, a particular reason. You, you mentioned that you got started in martial arts at a young age. Uh, when exactly did you start martial arts, and was there a reason behind it? My mom actually started me. I was about uh, six years old, and I remember all the kids in the neighborhood, uh, they were all going, but at that time, I think I was about five or four, and um, I was too young to go, but the minute I turned six, uh, I was of age, and I was then able to go, so as soon as I turned six, uh, I was able to jump into that class, and, uh, and I started with karate, and uh, I, I never looked back. Ever since then, been uh, going full steam ahead in the martial arts world. It, 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 do you recommend uh, you know kids that's starting out at a young age? I know growing up for me, a kid of the '80s, you had Karate Kid, you had you know Jean Claude Van Damme, Steven Seagal, you had the Power Rangers, you had the Ninja Turtles. So much martial arts kind of in your face, and that for whatever reason, kids see that and they're like, "Oh man, I want to emulate all these really cool, fun things that I see on TV." And then they go into a karate class or a martial arts class, and they're they're not showing you all the fun flips and stuff that you see on TV. You're seeing something completely different and there is a discipline to it. What do you say to young kids or, you know, maybe young adults or even older adults that see stuff on TV and want to emulate that stuff, but when they step into a class, it's not necessarily what you see right away. Well, exactly. I think you, you hit the nail on the head there, Joshy. Joshy it's, um, it's not what you see right away. And I think going into a martial arts class, you've got to build those foundations first. Uh, if you have a strong foundation, then all the other stuff can be built upon that foundation. All the cool stuff, the jumping, the acrobatic stuff, that, that all comes. But without a foundation, it's just, it's kind of superfluous moves, just kind of running through without proper technique. So it really, you do have to start with that foundation. Uh, be patient, especially for children, for young adults. Go in, learn the foundation, and then everything will build upon that. And you'll have a deeper understanding of the arts when you start with a traditional uh, foundation. Um, so I think it's very important 
uh, and children need a little bit of guidance with parents. I'm not, I'm not really against um, you know, parents having a little bit of a, a regimented outlook with the martial arts training of making sure the kids get there twice a week. And you know, sometimes the kid's going to say, I don't want to go. And sometimes the, the, it's okay for the parent to say, oh, come on, we need to do this. You know, get your gear on get to class just like sometimes a kid wakes up doesn't want to go to school you know parenting <laughs> says you know you got to go to school so a little bit of you know guidance with martial arts training when it does get a little bit difficult or when it does you know and children go through peaks and valleys sometimes they find it a little boring sometimes they're super excited about it but then it comes down to the instructor to making to making sure that the um the children are inspired that they're motivated when they do do see a kid getting a little bored in class go over give him some encouragement try and pick him up but that's not only for children that's for young adults adults as well everyone goes through peaks and valleys even myself i'll i'll go through moments when i'm really motivated with my training and then i'll have other times where i've you know got to give myself a kick in the pants to 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 get to the 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 gym or the dojo or to go for a training session so it's very important we recognize those peaks and valleys and we cater our mindset um, to deal with them and that goes for yourself if you're you're, with your own training it goes for parents trying to guide their children and and also goes for teenagers and young adults now do you find well first of all that's a great message and I, i love the fact that you know you encourage people to kind of stick with it because in the end the reward is way worth it you know what i mean you just give up because things get boring or hard or whatever you're never going to get the full benefit of it so i really appreciate the fact that you are more or less saying hey kind of stick with it you have stuck with it for such a long time have you ever been in a, a situation where you had to put those martial arts skills to use outside of a movie or a television set have you ever been in a like a situation as a young kid like a bully or a life-threatening situation and were you happy that you were able to have those set of skills i think growing up in in sydney in western sydney it was it was a pretty rough rough area people think of australia as you know lots of kangaroos and and koalas and and you know but um yeah growing up in western sydney it was rough um we were um, kind of in a in a middle class neighborhood. There was, we grew up around the corner from a pub when I was very young, and I remember myself and a couple of the other kids. We used to go on a Friday afternoon and and sit across the road from the pub because we knew sooner or later the guys would come out. They'd there'd be some fisty cuffs. They'd have a bit of a punch up, and then you'd see them shake hands and walk back into the pub to have a have a beer. So it was kind <laughs> of Australian culture. But and then you know the kids in the neighborhood. I think. There were times when we would we would see that, and we we were under the impression that was the way to sort out your differences. So, and a lot of the kids in the neighbourhood were doing martial arts at the time. Um, so, yeah, growing up, there were some some times where we we had these little child kind of driven battles, and you know everyone was you know doing a little bit of martial arts here and there. And um, so, I guess, and then growing up into teenage years, again, Western Sydney, pretty rough place. There were times where. You know, I was um, um, approached and uh, asked for my wallet at one stage and, and I wouldn't hand it over. So that, that ended in a little bit of, um, you know, f- physicality. But um, so, yeah, there has been times growing up. Um, but now, as you, you know, as you get older, you know, things change and um, you look at things differently. But um, uh-huh. to say never, no, that wouldn't be true. There, there has been times growing up where, you know, the martial arts um, potentially could have, could have saved me from a lot of harm. Obviously, you just talked about you know your your martial arts training. What kind of propelled you into the world of acting? Um, because again, you you said to yourself, you know, well trained martial artist, and then all of a sudden you're kind of thrown into this acting gig. Was that something that was planned, or was that something that you just kind of fell in? No, it, it was planned. Um, right now, what we're seeing, we're seeing the golden age of martial arts. Uh, where martial artists and combat athletes can make quite a, a lucrative living and, and, a, and a well living. Um, when I was at my peak, that really wasn't an option. I was seeing some uh, people, you know, who were world championships signing autographs for $10 a pop pictures just to make a living to, to pay the rent. And um, 
I'd been in the national team. I'd traveled all over the world. Some of the, the cost I had to bear myself and of my parents because the first time I was in the national team, I was 16 years old. Um, and it wasn't completely covered by the association or, or government. There was a little bit of a subsidy. So when, when I looked at the martial arts, it was like, okay, the, the only, um, it's, it's going to be a little hard, to, to, especially in Australia, to make a living as a combat athlete. Um, so I was always amazed with particularly Asian uh, cinema, uh, the Japanese um, uh, Akira Kurosawa movies and uh, a lot of the, the, the Chinese films with, with Bruce Lee and whatnot. Um, and I was always really drawn to that. And then I started a li- acting a little bit late, um, but I didn't go from like going in from doing some martial arts stuff and then stunts and, and that, as I said, I was never a stuntman, um, in, like a working stuntman. Um, so, so in that sense, if martial arts taught, taught me anything, it was if you want to get good at something, you've got to put time into it. So I started doing some short courses for acting. And um, I went to New York and I, and I did a full-time summer, summer conservatory at a place called the Barrow Group Theatre. And I realised at that point that I knew nothing about acting. And to, to think that I did was just ignorant. So would I came you say back to that Australia. You were, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. But I was just saying, are you, do you, yeah. would you say that you were ahead of the curve, right? You're seeing all these guys, I wouldn't necessarily call them has but maybe these karate champions or martial artists, they were just, that was their craft. And you started to see like, hey, look, I could... I could segue this into something better where these guys were signing autographs for 10 bucks a pop. You were trying to better your craft in a sense. Would you say that that was the case or? Yeah, I just, I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to see myself struggling like them. You know, they were okay. great martial artists. They were the combat. And in today's, um, today's day and age, they would be making quite a, a lucrative um, living, but I just didn't see how, how that was possible. Um, moving forward. Um, and the other thing too, when you're a combat athlete, in, not in all cases, but you become so focused, so focused, that you miss a lot of, of for lack of a better term, of beauty of, of the peripheral surroundings of the world. And I think, and as I said, I, I achieved a lot at a very young age in the martial arts, but I, I somehow knew that there was more. Um, so... That, that's kind of what pushed me out to, to, to see other things and um, going to New York, studying, and then coming back to Australia. And um, at that sense, I auditioned for one of the universities, um, for one of the top drama schools. And I went through that, that, that process. Um, and I came out at the other end. And, um, and then I just pursued the acting career. I didn't bring the martial arts and the acting together. They were, they were two separate kind of things to me. They have found their way together, obviously, um, as you, you probably know from, from the body of work that I've done. But um, they were two very separate things for me. And I think as, as an actor, you strip a lot of ways of uh, layers of, um, of armor, of, of blockage, of... Um, uh, of humanity, you, you you peel it away, and you get to understand the human condition a lot more, and it makes you much more receptive, much more compassionate. Um, Definitely, the much martial more vulnerable, arts, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Where the martial arts, at some times growing up, I I felt like such a a tunnel vision to to one focus, and and that's okay because that's that's one aspect of uh, of the the human psyche as well, developing that area. Um, and I think you need that as well, but there is so much more. Um, and I guess that's what I wanted. I just wanted to, you know, live life on a, on a fuller spectrum and not just, not just focused in on that area. But don't get me wrong, martial arts is a huge part of my life. Um, it always has been, always will be. Um, you know, I still study martial arts. I'm still learning. I'm still improving. I'm still getting better and better. And the tenacity that it's given me in all areas of my life, um, it's, it's, it's something that I don't feel like I could have gotten anywhere else. That's why I think martial arts is it's invaluable for children. Um, the greatest gift a parent can give a child is a good martial arts school. And it doesn't matter what style. It doesn't matter if it's Taekwondo, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, Muay Thai, Karate. It does not matter about the style. It matters about the instructor. If the instructor is yeah. good, if the instructor is motivational, if they're o- offering solid knowledge and, and sound um, instructional and, and sharing of, of the martial arts, that student is going to benefit. 
Um, so although I wanted more in other areas, that, that's not to say that, that, uh, that I was disappointed or, or unfulfilled with my martial arts. If I didn't have my martial arts, I would be completely unfulfilled because that's such a huge part of who I am and part of my life. So I think um, it was just I wanted that plus I wanted to... I wanted more, and that's—I guess—that's what—that's what drove me into the to the acting. Yeah, there were a little things like seeing people I knew, um, you know, struggling with with just trying to make a living from the martial arts here and there. Um, but as a, from a personal point of view, I just wanted more. I wanted I wanted my martial arts plus I wanted a whole lot more as well. So that's what kind of Do pushed you- me out into all the other areas. Yeah. Do you think that your you know the way your mantra in having a person or a family or a, or, or a mom and dad find their kid a, a, a you know a martial arts coach was that your way into acting? Did you find your you know your acting coach or you know whoever was helping you with your acting classes or your acting school? Did you look at them in the same kind of light? Like I got to find the right person that fit for me. And you know also was it intimidating because you're pretty much starting all over again, right? Yeah, it is. I mean, sometimes you, you, you have to, and, that, and that's, I guess that's stripping away the ego, isn't it, Joshua? You have to yeah. put a white belt back on um, just to compare. Like, so, as I said, remember I said when I went to the Barrow Group Theatre, I did a, a, a six-week full-time summer, summer conservatory in, in an acting school. And after that, you think, oh, okay, I know a bit. But I realised at that point that I knew nothing. And I came back to Australia just for an analogy, I put that white belt back on and I went back to school. Mm -hmm. Um, And I was willing to learn everything again from the the ground up. Now, when I was at university, we didn't have the best teachers. um, And to to be honest with you, a lot of them were just, I think, sour that they didn't get the, the acting career that they wanted and they were just teaching to pay the bills. But then we had a few of the teachers come in that were amazing like absolutely amazing and they're the ones that you you look to and they're the ones that feed you with knowledge and you grow from being around people like that um so yeah there were times where where, as you said before you you're vulnerable and you're like every time you get up and, and you're you know doing a scene or you're doing something you're putting yourself on the line you're putting yourself open for judgment you're putting yourself open for people to think oh he sucks or he or he's great um so there is a little bit of a fear factor um every time you you step up in front of camera stage whatever medium but um there's something inside you that says keep going you yeah. know keep going and it's the same with martial arts you know you step into the ring you're by yourself you step onto the mat to fight doesn't matter whether it's brazilian jiu jitsu muay thai mma whatever the the fight thing you step on that mat you're by yourself you're alone the only person that's going to help you in there is you yeah you got your coaches in the corner the training it's all done but when it comes down to it it's you who do you have to rely on you you know it's the same when you're acting, you learn your lines, you stand up, you fall flat on your face, you don't have anyone to blame but yourself. It's you. Yeah. You've only got yourself to rely on again. So, yeah, there's always going to be that fear factor. And, um, you know, I'm not going to stand here or sit here <laughs> and lie to you and say, <laughs> hey, you know, look, I, I, I'm, I'm never scared. I'm, I'm Superman. I'll stand up. But no, you, you're, you're a human being. And there, there, there are times where you have doubt. There are times when you're full of confidence. There's, there are times when there's a bit of fear, you know, but as long as you know what it is, when the fear sets in or a little bit of anxiety sets in, you recognize it and you know what it is and you remember to breathe. Um, and one thing I tell, um, you know, tell my kids and uh, tell a lot of my students that when you get nervous, I, I tell them nerves is just excitement when you're forgetting to breathe. Yeah. And then once they take that deep breath and they start to breathe, the, the feeling's still kind of there, but they, you, you tend to learn to deal with it a little bit better. And I think that can go for anyone. Anytime you feel nervous, um, fearful, you, you're anxious, just tell yourself, which it, well, this is what works for me, I tell myself, okay, you're just excited and you're forgetting to breathe. And then suddenly the heart rate comes down a bit, the air starts to flow a bit better, and... Um, and it's just a, an easier way of kind of dealing with it and pushing through. Brand, that's a, an excellent philosophy. In fact, I don't know if the people at the Com app are listening, but I mean, I think you have your next spokesperson <laughs> right here. Brand will walk you through a nice calm meditation because 
I'll, I'll be honest, I was a little anxious, but now not so much. Took the big deep breaths, like you mentioned. Um, now, going <laughs> in after your, uh, after your, your, uh, your acting classes, what was the big break? I think on camera, there was a, a show called National, uh, National Geographic, on the National Geographic channel, sorry, Joshi, called Fight Science. Now, that kind of made me pop a little bit more in the martial arts world, but, the fir- but that was, wasn't really acting. It was obviously my, my physical skill, um, and that was quite some time ago. But I think my big break came... In, Aust- in Australia, the first thing that popped was, it, it all happened, it was a weird time, like, I suddenly got one thing, and then, I think mindset, and, and um, I don't want to get all uh, philosophical and talk about vibrate, vibrating on frequencies and stuff like that. That's some people okay, get you can. Me, some people were like, what's this guy talking about? <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I got, I, I booked a role on a, on a movie called Cedar Boys, um, and then around that same time, I started just landing guest roles on Australian TV shows. So everything started happening at once. But I think the Cedar Boys, I got, it was a critically acclaimed film and it tackled some difficult subjects. Um, and in terms with the critics, it, 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 it did really well. And it was just a straight drama. Um, and I played uh, a man in, in jail, desperately trying to guide his, his brother, a w- younger brother, away from the criminal path. So his brother would go out and do all this, you know, stuff and get involved with bad people and come back and, and talk to me about it. Um, so that kind of got me a, a, a little bit of attention. And it also screened in Australians in film in Los Angeles. That kind of moved things along for me a little bit. Um, and then... In Australia, I kind of didn't do that much. I, I ended up over in the States again after those uh, bouncing around on some of the major Australian TV shows as a guest star and obviously that film. Then National Geographic Channel brought me out to the States and I did the, a couple of... Um, the, it was a series now for Fight Science. So we already did the feature-length documentary and then we started doing episode, episodes for Fight Science. So I was involved in a bunch of that and then shortly after that, I ended up on uh, Days of Our Lives. <laughs> what? <laughs> Which I, I and again, I, we we've I, we've had some other guests on the show, and uh, another um, a person who dabbled in martial arts as well also ended up on a soap opera. So I think it's just kind of funny that you know Days of Our Lives soap opera is you know coming up with such wonderful storylines to keep us all interested, including myself. I'm not a fan, but I would definitely watch it knowing <laughs> that Bren Foster was on. And uh, what was the role that you played on Days of Our Lives? Please tell me it was like a uh, was, villain. Uh, you were like, the, like, like you were a villain. You had an eye patch. You were the you know, stepbrother of somebody <laughs> who died in a fire. I was, uh, my name was Quinn Hudson. And, oh, um, what, first of all, what a great a name, like, Quinn Hudson. Qu- I know, right? Quinn Hudson. Yeah. It's, um, uh, and there was a, a, quite the iconic character of Vivian, her name was, and, and she was a, str- and sorry, she was an iconic character on Days of Our Lives. Everyone who, who had been watching the show for, for years would know her. And she was kind of a, um, you know, a bad person from time to time. And, uh, but apparently she went to Australia and, um, had, had a child and, um, he was long lost and she never had contact with him. And then he came back to, uh, to find her. Um, and his character, he, was, uh, he, wasn't, he wasn't too good at first. He was a bit of a drug dealer and um, he you know, kind of coerced one of the girls into prostitution. So he was a pimp. And, uh, but yeah, so they kind of... And then he almost got framed for murder, but it wasn't him. And then he, they kind of flipped him and he, he started to become a good guy. Um, and um, and yeah, and then by the time um, his character ran his course, he um, he ended up leaving, chasing one of his true loves. Um, so yeah, but I, I must say, you know, I, I did enjoy my time on on Days of Our Lives. I mean, it, there's a lot of lot of dialogue, um, and you got to be prepared. Prepared. You only get one take sometimes, and if you get it right and it's good, it's it's done. That's it. Um, so it moves at such a fast pace and you're doing anywhere from, you know, six to eight episodes a week, if I'm recalling correctly. Um, but yeah, but I, I really enjoyed my, my time there. The people there were lovely. The, the other, most of the other actors were, were, were lovely too. And, um, yeah, but, uh, it was good. I, I had a good time at the time. Yeah. And it's still going. So you know that it's still popular yeah. and that it's, it's <laughs> been on right, TV yeah. for forever. So right yeah, after days of our lot. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. So right after Days of Our Lives, it looks like you have some guest appearances on some other TV show. And then uh, it looks like you were in a movie with a personal favorite of mine, Mr. Stone Cold Steve Austin. Uh, how was that? <laughs> Steve is the man. I, that guy was, um, he, was a, he was such a, such a good guy. Such a good guy. Um, we spent a bit of time together on set, you know, traveling to and from, and um, yeah, just just got on like a house on on, on fire. Haven't spoken to him, to him lately or anything, but at at the time he was um, he was it was really nice to see. He was a good guy. I particularly remember one thing: we we got back to the hotel and we're going up in the lift, and um, we were in a bit of a crowded lift, <laughs> and uh, we're in there together. And um, there were some ladies and, and gents in the lifts and um, there was some whispering and some murmuring going on and he must have heard something. And I was on Days of Our Lives at the time and we were in, we were in Canada uh, filming uh, Maximum Conviction. So he gets out of the elevator and I, I don't know what he heard, but he said, yes, it's him. He's on Days of Our Lives. So then he walks <laughs> out and he leaves me in the lift with, uh, with all these, these people. And um, I'm getting off on the top floor. So I get off on the top floor and, um, you know, they asked, I think they, they, would, they were fans of the show Days of Our Lives and they asked for some photos and some autographs and stuff. But he really left me in it. He kind of just confirmed it because maybe I would have got away without, you know, but not, not that I minded or anything. They were really nice. But, uh, yeah. but it was just funny. He, he got me good. He got me real good. <laughs> that's what we that's what we call in the wrestling business a rib and he got you good for sure uh but yes no steve steve is a great guy uh, i was i worked with him on the movie the longest yard which was a lot of fun but i saw yeah, that in, yeah, your, awesome. in, in your in your resume and i was like oh i gotta ask him about steve because steve's a great guy <laughs> steve's great great but guy. steve's not great the only guy. one right you've worked with some pretty some big names living legends steven seagal danny trejo ving rames uh you also got to do yeah. something really cool uh, which is the voice of Mad Max in a video game? Yeah, that's so yeah, that's that was iconic. Good. It was it was good. It was um, that's another job I I thoroughly enjoyed. Chris Zimmerman, who was the the director of it at the time, um, she was a, a lovely lady, um, and I, I don't know if people know, but the, the amount of time I think it was it was definitely over a couple of years, um, because we would go in and we do sessions and then. And then we'd leave, and it would be, and then obviously they'd go away and do all the the graphics and work they needed to do, and and put my voice and and performance to to the stuff, um, and then we'd move on to the next section. So, it, it it spanned over about two years, Joshy. So it was, and it was fun. It, it was good. Um, even voicing it, you, you're standing there in the in the voice booth, looking at images, and um, you know, it, it was it, it was some a good experience it was it was heartfelt because in in the game there's a there's a little girl and a woman that max max kind of saves and helps but at the same time he's you know battling some some ogres for, for lack of a better term ogres <laughs> <laughs> um but um yeah it was it was it was good that's another another job i i really had a good time doing and um and some of the other characters um, Jason, I can't remember his last name, and, and I'm not going to try and pronounce it in case I, I butcher it. But um, he was such a phenomenal, like character type actor, and the voice and and performance that that he gave, and we got to do a lot of scenes together. That was that was great. Um, and as, and Chris, the, the the director of the whole thing, she was um, she had a real way with kind of you know nurturing and, and pulling out our performances. So um, yeah, I um, I absolutely loved every every bit of uh, doing Mad Max. Are you a, a gamer yourself? Do you like playing video games? I do a little bit. I was playing a bit yeah. of Tekken last night. <laughs> oh, great. Yeah, I do. I like Tekken. I, I, yeah, yeah. I like Tekken, Mortal Kombat, and Street Fighter. That is just, as a kid growing up, Street Fighter was just, was like, uh, it was life. Um, it, we were at the, it's uh, so funny. Shops, Gro- playing on the old... Um, yeah, I was about to say, growing up, it was either you're a Street Fighter guy or you're a Mortal Kombat guy. Or if you're a real lunatic, you were so good, you could play both. <laughs> I was more of a Street Fighter guy. But yeah, that was, again, around that same time yeah. where in the late 80s, early 90s, just martial arts was just taking over everything, including video games. So yeah. it's really kind of yeah. fun that you were a big... Now, who is your character in Street Fighter? Who is your go-to guy? 
Uh, it was Ryu. Ryu was my uh, my number one. Yeah. yeah, Ryu was my number one. And believe it or not, I used to like Dal Sim too. Just with the stretchy arms, the reach, he used to work well for me too. Um, but yeah, I, those two were my guys. Yeah. You know who's very underrated in Street Fighter, and also it takes a lot of skill to learn is Zangief. If you can beat the game with Zangief, it's almost like oh, yes. you know top level in my opinion. So Tekken, Mortal Kombat. Street Fighter, those are the video game side. Was there anything else, whether it be growing up, young adult, even as an adult now, that you gravitate towards? Comic books, music, movies, TV shows that you are a fan of? Yeah. Um, it, I've, I always had a love for, for movies. And then TV series started coming in. And obviously I got, I got pulled in some really, really good TV series. Um, Game of Thrones, um, The Last Kingdom on Netflix. And I, I do like the period pieces for some reason. Um, I don't know, maybe in another life I was there. Who knows? <laughs> but um, I, I do like that stuff. Um, as of now, I'm really moving back towards movies. Um, I don't know it's whether it's, it was through COVID or, or whatnot, but I, I, for some reason, movies are pulling me back in. You know, recently I've been watching everything that Denzel Washington has done. Um, and just looking at him too as an actor, I'd like to, to, to see how he, he tackles all his materials. But um, yeah, as, as of now, Josh, I'm going to have to say I'm, I'm back to the movies. Um, I'm finding it a little hard to kind of get hooked by any TV series at the moment. Um, and I'm going back and I'm watching a lot of older stuff too. Um, so yeah, I think yeah, I, I'm back to back to being a movie man, I guess. What what kind of older stuff? I'm assuming TV wise, are you going back and watching? Um, well, not TV wise. I'm I'm going back and watching a lot of the film the the movies that um, that kind of really appealed to me. Yeah, so I was watching a, a Bronx Tale, which was um, written by uh, Chaz Palamenteri. I hope I've just said his uh, surname correctly and directed by De Niro. I think that's that's a really good movie too. I went back. Yeah, and um, watching The Godfather Part 2. Part 2 is my favourite. For some reason, I can watch Part 2 over and over again. Um, another movie that I watch over and over again is The Raid Part 2. Um, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an Indonesian film, and, but the martial arts in it is... I love it. It's not clean. It's not very... A lot of people... Why I like it so much, I think, is because it's not clean. You can look at the Chinese choreography and it's very crisp and clean. It's very, like, very... Even the way they move, everything's very clean and crisp. Where when you look at the Indonesian martial arts, the Salat, uh, Salat style, it's, it's not very clean. Even when they throw a kick, it's a bit... It's, it's, it's a bit messy. It's a bit bit off. I mean, it's very precise, their art, but it's not, the choreography is not as clean as something you'd look at in, in the Chinese world of martial arts. Um, and I think that's why I like it. And it fills the space very well. It goes high, low, and everything. So that's another movie. And the other thing about The Raid too, I think it's very Godfather-esque. Um, even the acting, um, it's, it's quite minimal. Um, no one's pushing or trying too hard, but I, I don't know. I can, that's one movie. Again, I can watch over and over and over again. Um, the other one that I recently had a look at was, um, uh, all the Batman movies. Um, uh -huh. I went back to them and, and I also watched, uh, Christopher Nolan's full length Justice League, which goes for a four, about four hours, which I thought was pretty good. Now I'm not a huge, huge fan of superhero movies, not all of them. Some of them, like the movie Logan with um, uh, obviously Wolverine, that is amazing. I, I love that. When I think with the Marvel stuff and the DC stuff, I like it when it's a little darker. I, I, I love it, especially Batman. Batman, I watch Batman and with the darkness, the, the Christopher Nolan Batmans, I'm just, it, it consumes me. I, I love it. When they start moving away and start trying to go 
try, trying to make it a little too comedic and, and they go for the funny. I'm like, oh man, I, I don't know. It just doesn't, I like the darkness a little bit better. Um, not that I'm a dark person, but I just, <laughs> on, on the movies, I, I like it. And that's why, I guess why I liked Christopher Nolan's uh, four-hour Justice League because he went into the characters a little bit more and you got to, although they're superheroes and I don't know if we can call them human apart from Batman and his superpower is him being rich. <laughs> but... Um, it was just, you know, it, it pulled me into them. There was like, there was a, it just, you, you got to know them as a, as a person a little bit better in Christopher Nolan's four hour length um, uh, um, version. I think of the you're, film. I, and, I think you mean Zack Snyder. Sorry, I didn't mean to correct you. I sorry, yes, yes, fan, yes, sorry, yeah. Zack Snyder. Christopher I don't want a bunch of fanboys coming well. after you because yeah, they come no, after I'm you. I'm sorry, I apologize. Yeah, that's yeah, okay. I, get my, uh, I got your back. I'm going to talk about it. <laughs> so, Zack, Zack Snyder's four hour. Um, version of Justice League to me how he went into the characters and just just e explored them a little bit more um, went into a little bit of how they felt felt personally um, it was just I mean that, how, all right they're, they're superheroes they got these powers but they think they feel they they go they're, they're emotional and when we get to see that side of a superhero what do we do as humans we, we relate straight away. It's yeah. like, oh, oh man, yeah, all right, he's got these powers, but you know, he thinks, he feels, he this. Straight away, we're invested. Straight away, we want to know what, what, what's next for this, this character. Um, as opposed to when it gets too comedic and fluffy and it's this, it's like, oh yeah, okay, this is cool, this is fun. But for me personally, I don't get pulled in and invested. But with Zack Snyder's four-hour version of Justice League, I was invested. I was yeah. really invested. I didn't move for the entire duration. I sat in my chair and I just watched that whole movie with, with total invest, investment. And then at the end of it, I was like, that was good. That took yeah. me for a ride. That's what I want. That's what I want. Um, and things like Logan um, with Wolverine. Again, I, to bring that up, I love that movie. All the Batman movies. Batman Begins, The Dark Knight, The Dark Knight Rises, they're dark. They pull me in. And I guess it's just because when it's a little darker, I tend to think it's a, it's a truer representation of humanity. Yeah. You know? But don't get me wrong. The comedic um, stuff of Guardians of the Galaxy, that's... That's beautiful. Okay, I yeah. love Guardians of the Galaxy, and that was lighter, and that was funny. But that's Guardians of the Galaxy, you know, Justice League, Batman, Logan. They need to stay dark. Were but you hey, a fan? My opinion. Of... <laughs> it's okay. I, I love it. I think it's great. I, I agree with most of that stuff. Um, when have you have you were you a big fan of Daredevil, the TV show on Netflix? Yes, yes, Joshy, I yeah. was. I because I was about to that say TV that TV show. Yes. Yeah, that, that TV show Absolutely. is just the epitome the of what arts. you were saying. Yeah, yeah, the martial well, you got martial Absolutely. arts, very, very dark, and your lead actor, so to speak, uh, wasn't really born with any kind of superpowers. He just was a kid and got you know toxic waste stuck in his eyes. So, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah that's another great one. But that's um, that's now, great, and the um, the, sorry, and the level of martial arts in that too was good. It was good. Oh, great! The, some of those fight scenes, whether it was um, yeah, I'm trying to think, there was like a hallway scene that he that they were in. It was just amazing. That was epic. That was great. Really good work. So, so you're getting back into movies. You are uh, rewatching some of your favorites, uh, including Zack Snyder's Justice League. What about physical fitness? Uh, obviously, we we were, or you were, or Australia was in the middle of a pandemic. They're kind of getting out of it here in the states. Where we see the light at the end of the tunnel, which I mentioned before. But during that yeah. time where we all were kind of locked down, what were you doing to keep yourself not only mentally fit but physically fit? I was in the I'm in the states for for most of last year. I, I didn't leave until till the end of October. So. I was spending a lot of time with my, my daughter, um, and at the time we had a little, uh, we still have our, but she's no longer a one-year-old, she's two, but my daughter was um, seven at the time. So we were training together, and I was training her and my wife. Um, 
we would go back in the back room. We have a dojo with, with mats and a bag and we have some weight equipment there. So it was very important that we made the effort to, to get in there at least once a day. Um, we had a nice backyard. We would swim a lot too. Um, so it was very important that, that I led the way with the family um, and gave them some goals to, to train to. And what I did with my daughter, we, uh, we started her, her official uh, training in uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and Taekwondo. Oh, that's and, great. Um, while we were in, yeah, while we were in quarantine, she was able to gain her first two belts in Taekwondo and, and gain a strength oh. in her Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So that's she awesome. Had, and they were official gradings. Yeah, Josh, I, I would put on my uniform. I would put on my belt. I you know, sat at the desk. I obviously trained her and made, had her well prepared <laughs> and, and, and she knew the syllabus. And then my wife ended up joining in too. And uh, my wife obviously had trained, but she chose to go back to the beginning and do all the gradings with my daughter as well. So when grading time came, and we had two gradings in lockdown, one every three months, um, we put the desk down and they knew their syllabus and I would call out what to do and I'd uh, mark them on each. So we made it very, very official. It wasn't, uh, we didn't just phone it in. And then um, we ordered her belt on Amazon. So there was a belt there waiting for her. And, um, <laughs> That's great. Yeah. And we ordered like a little medal as well for uh, outstanding performance awards. So just, just to give her something to look forward to, to train to. And, you know, when she, when she, pa- and she passed with flying colors. Um, oh, of course you know, she did, her right? Yeah. around her ways. Yeah. Yeah, of course, because she was well prepared. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. So it, it was good. So that was very important. And, and I think it was also important that she see her mum and dad training as well, that she would see that I was training, that her mother was training. Um, and that in turn would motivate her to train. She was much more motivated when she knew her mum was also training. Like if she saw, if she had a training session, she was like, she would ask, is mum going to train with you tonight? And I was like, yeah, she sure is. And she'd come and watch. And sometimes she'd even join in a little bit with our sessions too. Sometimes she would train with her mum. So, and and how they, and and revisiting what we spoke a a little bit uh, about before, about parents' guidance with martial arts. What I find is kids will start and then a little bit down the track, parents will start when the whole family is doing martial arts suddenly it becomes more of a valuable practice within that family now if a father's doing it a mother's doing it all the the brothers and sisters and children are are doing it that becomes part of that family and it becomes a little bit of a lifestyle for them and what better way of bringing into your family disciplined a, a disciplined training environment something you all have in common, something that you can all go to, to, to events and compete at, suddenly it becomes a staple in the home, suddenly it becomes a bit of a lifestyle and you're getting fit, you're staying healthy, kids and parents are in a disciplined environment. So, I mean, what, what could be better than that? I mean, obviously there's a lot of great things in life, but I think martial arts for children and for the family as a whole, it's invaluable. You but know, I think it's you, such I, a great thing. Yeah, I think you just kind of hit the nail on the head in the sense that, like, look, it, you know, there are tons of exercise regimens and different sports and obviously martial arts. There's things that people can do uh, all yeah. over the place. Look, when I started to get into fitness, it was my dad who was like, hey, do you want to come with me to the gym? He never forced me to go. I never felt like it was a burden for me to go. It was just kind of bonding time with me and my dad. And then, of course, like my little brother would come. And then, you know, sometimes, not all the time, but my mom would come and stuff. And so it felt like, oh, this is a big family kind of bonding experience, which a lot of people don't necessarily have that anymore. So when you sit there and, t- and, and, and say, hey, look, like, you know, we did this together as a family. Hopefully there are more people out there like that doing that because it's such a fun and wonderful experience. And at the same time too, you're, you're, you're healthy, you're, you're, you're getting healthy, you're getting physically fit in some way, shape or form. Absolutely, Josie, you, you're 100% right, mate. Absolutely, couldn't agree more. Well, th- first of all, this has been an absolute pre- pleasure, Brent. I, I am a, a, a big fan of uh, being able to get to talk to you. Obviously, you're in Australia. I'm in Venice Beach, California, which is also kind of cool in <laughs> itself. Nice. Uh, but before, 
before I let you go, I always ask this question. I always put my guests on the spot, and of course, you are no exception. I am a big pro. I am a big pro wrestling fan. In case you didn't know, um, and I ask my guests if they could book your pop culture WrestleMania main event. It could literally be anything. It could be Logan versus Superman versus who else did you say? Bruce Lee versus, you know, Baby Yoda in a fatal four-way match. It could be Steven Seagal versus Stone Cold Steve Austin versus Danny Trejo (laughs) in a ladder match. It literally could be anything you want, any realm of pop culture. You can mix comics, music, uh, martial arts, actors. What would... Bren Foster's pop culture main event at WrestleMania B. Uh, I'd have to say Wolverine and Batman. Go oh, I like that. Guys. One. So, yeah, I'd like to see them see them going at it. I think as, as much as I've done this, usually I'll get a Wolverine or I'll get a Batman. And I don't think, and I'll have Super, du- Super Producer Alan double check, but I don't think we've had a Batman versus Wolverine. Um, so <laughs> the big question is, Who's going to win and why? Yeah, yeah. Batman's got a lot of gadgets and a lot of stuff that he can pull. And, um, but Wolverine's going to keep on healing. But I think, I think Batman will subdue him. Okay. In terms of stop him from moving, you know. Hang on. I know it's a pro wrestling match. I should ask. Is, is Batman allowed to use all his gadgets? Of course. I mean, there are no rules. They're, the rules okay, are set by you, cool. my friend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. So I would have to go with Batman. It's going to be close, and uh, I think Batman's going to sustain some damage. But I think um, I think he'll subdue um, Wolverine and take away his mo- mobility and um, potentially, you know, pin him to something to the ground. It's one of the posts of the ring, whatnot. But he'll he'll um, he'll stop him from moving. And I think uh, at the end, uh, Batman's arm will get re- will uh, will be raised. Okay, I like that answer. And hopefully, at the end, they all go to the pub and settle things over a beer, right? Am I right? Yeah, you got to do it with the Australian, mate. Yeah, exactly. You got to do it with the Australian. Then, uh, then go for a beer. That's it. Oh. Well, awesome, Brent. Thank you so much. You are in luck, though. You don't get to do the workout. Hopefully, the folks at home will. We have a Brent Foster inspired workout coming to you in just a few moments. Thanks again, Brent. Appreciate it, man. Awesome. Thanks, Joshy. Sideshow Collectibles. What's going on, Josh G? Jen Houston. And today we have a workout for you. Uh, 10, 20, 30, 20, 10. An ascending ladder followed by a descending ladder of two movements. Squat taps and shoulder taps. The lovely Jen is going to demonstrate. And of course, the one and only is going to commentate. Jen, are you ready? I'm ready. I love you, thousand. I'm ready. Cap in the house in three, two, one. Let's go. Now the first movement you could do virtually anywhere. It is called a squat tap. So you're gonna squat all the way down and or as low as you can. You're gonna tap the floor like the lovely Jen is doing and then you're gonna stand right back up. That is considered one rep. That is considered two reps and you're gonna do this for a total of 30 reps at the start. Then you'll do it for 20 and then 10 and then 20 and then 30. You get it. I just wanted Jen to keep squat tapping. The next movement in our ascending and descending ladder is the shoulder tap. You're gonna get to the top of your push-up like the lovely Jen is about to do. You are going to tap the top of your shoulders. That is one rep, that is two reps. You're gonna go all the way to hit that designated target of reps, 30, 20, 10, 20, 30. Whew, keep it going, Jen. Now that workout is meant to burn out your legs, to burn out and or tax your core and detach your shoulders. Remember, when you're doing those shoulder taps, make sure you engage your core. Stay nice and tight and rigid on those squats. Nice upright torso squat all the way down or as low as you can and jump all the way up. Good job, Jen. Another solid effort, another solid fun workout here for Sideshow Collectibles and Get Super with Joshi G. And like we always say, don't forget to let your geek side show. Did you enjoy that video? Be sure to subscribe by hitting the S icon on your screen and click the bell icon to be notified whenever a new video is posted. If you'd like more info on the items featured in this video, click the link provided under product info. Thanks for watching and don't forget to let your geek side show.